entertainmentbuddha.com back with another Star Wars Time Show. Woohoo! Feels like a while since we've done one, Nick, but I think we're just back to our every two-week schedule. Or it's because I've started doing Game of Thrones podcasts as well. So those of you listening, if you like Game of Thrones, make sure to check out our Thrones Time Shows, which we record every Tuesday, and they go out usually uh, the Thursday after the most recent episode of Game of Thrones. So anyways, dude, you know, we're both headed off to vacation. We were wondering if we were going to have anything to talk about before we took kind of a little break from the airwaves. And lo and behold, Entertainment Weekly drops all sorts of Star Wars The Last Jedi bombs this week to promote its fall movie preview issue, which they do every summer, and, and they do pack in some great content for the upcoming fall film schedule. So The Last Jedi dominated their coverage so far. They've put out... I think seven exclusive pieces in the past two days, and they have one more coming tomorrow uh, where we're going to learn more about Ryan's thoughts on Ray's parentage. So they're not done yet. So with that being said, before Nick and I get into these uh, pieces to discuss them, I do want to put out a spoiler warning. Now, yes, these were released. They were sanctioned by Disney. um, But even the director today, Ryan Johnson, just two hours ago on Twitter put out, There's more coming, and he advises us all to steer clear. I mean, he pretty much said it's part of the business of making a movie. They they have to promote it. They're going to write stuff. They're probably going to write stuff that you would have rather been surprised about. So we're just giving you a little warning right here. Everything we're talking about, it's not leaks. It's nothing like that. I mean, I wouldn't call them spoilers, but they technically are if you're someone that wants zero frame of reference going into The Last Jedi. So there it is, and here we go. All right, Nick, so I think the first piece or piece is I want to touch on are the Luke and Ray stuff because I think we got some interesting insights that may have confirmed or uh, unconfirmed some of our thoughts on how Luke and Ray's thread is going to play out. And before we get into it, just to summarize what we have now learned, um, essentially Luke is a man that has become overpowered by regret And he really wants to just kind of forget about his past and just live out the rest of his days in isolation. We find out that he's become very uh, grumpy and and disillusioned and is just kind of an angry man. Uh, We don't know if it's I mean, I think some of it is anger at himself for what happened with uh, his pupil, Ben Solo. Um, some of it is he doesn't really feel like he has a strong connection to the force as he does. Uh, but with that being said, he has exiled himself for a reason. So, and the reason isn't, oh, woe is me. I just want to feel sorry for myself. And obviously Ryan didn't give us those details, but there is a reason that Luke went into exile and he thought it was essentially the best thing for the galaxy. And yes, it was confirmed that he knows What's happening in the in the in the galaxy through the force, but he still thinks his place on Acto is where he should be. All right, dude. So were you, I guess, surprised at this description of Luke? And, you know, we're, we'll get into his relationship with Ray. But I mean, did, did that surprise you at all? Or did you kind of expect that just based on what we saw at the end of The Force Awakens, that this is not Return of the Jedi Luke, who is full of piss and vinegar and the light side and, and Ray to kick the dark side's ass? Yeah, I mean, you could kind of tell from the introduction to him in The Force Awakens that he was a different man. And everybody on the internet has these, you know, theories out there that he's this dark side guy now. He's evil. There's uh, There's been this in the ether for a long time. I never truly bought into that, but I really did buy into the fact that he was that he was broken, essentially. Like, he was a broken man, and whether it be just from the you know, the Jedi Academy debacle with uh, Ben or, you know, other things stacked on top of that. Like, he is significantly different than we've ever seen him before. And now we have that confirmed. And to be completely honest, like you said in the beginning of this cast, man, I mean, like, they they have some serious, serious plot points in here. And, like, I was surprised that we've had this big of, you know, a reveal so far in front of the movie. I mean, essentially, you get to find out that, like, 
Luke is pretty much telling Ray, like, leave. Don't. I don't know why you're here. I don't know why you have this lightsaber, but I don't want you here. Just get the fuck out off my island and then go back to, you know, the, the resistance and fight your fight. It's not my fight anymore. And, uh, you know, it is kind of surprising to hear that he is so, you know, headstrong about going, you know, going back into the fray and even training Ray from what it seems like. So it's, it's pretty it's pretty heavy shit that's going to be going on between these two characters. Yeah, they, the article kind of described their initial meeting as Luke just kind of going like, yeah, well, so what? What, what the fuck do you want from me? Um, and, and Ray, you got to remember what, what type of mind frame this character of Ray is in. Sure, she met some great friends previously in The Force Awakens. One of them happened to die. He was kind of a father figure. Uh, BB-8 was her boy. Finn's her homeboy. Uh, she still is someone that has experienced uh, abandonment severely in her life. I mean, all we know so far is that as a young kid, she was dropped off on Jakku and essentially given to a junk dealer to fend for herself. So the fact that she shows up on this island with this vision of a Luke Skywalker who is heroic, did all these amazing, amazing things, and can do amazing things with the Force, she's probably expecting... Like, you know, a high five or like, hey, what's up? An embrace or some form of acceptance. But it sounds like Oscar the Luke is going to be pretty standoffish and somewhat uh, offer up a contentious relationship with Ray. I mean, there was an image in the article, Nick, where it looks like she's at his cave door and he's more or less saying, beat it. <laughs> like, fucking yeah, scram. <laughs> He's just, like, blocking the entrance to his cave. She's standing out there with her staff that she's, you know, always used on Jakku. And, yeah, like you said, he's, like, bow guarding the door. Like, look, just go away. I don't want you here. You can see that he has that mentality. He has that look on his face like, you know, you're here. I understand you're here and you want something from me, but I have nothing to give. It almost feels like that. It's like he's looking at this person who wants so much from him who's, you know, he, he probably knows that she's very powerful with the Force. He can probably sense it. And he's just like, I, I can't do anything for you. Go away. I've tried this before. I've failed. And look what's happened because of my failures. My failures have led the galaxy into the spot that it's in now. If I do it again with you, who knows what could happen? You know, you may turn to the dark side. You may join up with Snoke and Kylo Ren. And then everybody's really in trouble. So... Yeah, it's it's definitely different than the than the uh, acceptance that Luke found when he uh, ran into Ben Kenobi back on Tatooine, which is something they mentioned in the article. I mean, we can all remember that scene from Episode Four when Obi Wan and Luke first meet, and it's it's a very cordial relationship. Obi Wan's very happy to you know shepherd him through his Force training while he's still alive, introduce him to you know, all of these new and, and exciting things that Luke's experiencing coming into his own as a Force user. And this is pretty much the, the polar opposite uh, of what's going on with, with Ray and Luke in this situation. It's, it's pretty crazy to think that he could have that type of relationship with his mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and then treat Ray like this when she's clearly here to just learn and try to, you know, do good by the galaxy. It just goes to show you the the state of his mind in The Last Jedi. I mean, something severe has happened to this guy. And I want to read a few quotes from the article because I really think they helped to, to set the stage and paint the picture of, of, of Luke's mind and what he's been thinking all these years sitting out there. But... The whole comparison to Obi, I mean, it is a, a quite different situation, though, isn't it? I mean, Obi's whole charge with the rest of his life was to watch over this this kid. Where yeah. we don't know it yet. I mean, we don't know if I, – I, this article, I don't know if you read it. I, I don't think I copied the quote. But they did kind of nudge at like, or does Luke not know about Ray? Yeah, because I think uh, one – somebody – I think it was it was Daisy that said – you know, he has this Luke has this girl shows up on showing up on his island that he doesn't know. And then later on in the article, uh, Mark Hamill comes back and says, you know, or or does he not know? He may. Yeah, know. Exa so that's many, exactly what it was. <laughs> so th they're they're completely different situations in my mind. But, yeah, you would think someone that was trained by the, the, the old Ben and Yoda. I mean, shit, Yoda was the king of Jedi trainers. And really just how Luke behaved in, in Jedi. I mean, the fact that he 
overcame the, the pulls of the Emperor and the dark side and didn't kill his dad and did redeem his father and became a Jedi Knight. It, you know, Luke was like this doe-eyed force good, goody two-shoes. And now we come to find after we left him in Jedi, enough horrible shit happened to him or he did stuff that he didn't mean to do that caused horrible shit that he just doesn't want to do deal with anyone with the force. He wants to lock himself away until he's gone. Um, So the first quote I want to read, this is from Johnson. It kind of sets up. Again, Luke's mindset and and not really wise on the island, but just he's not a wuss. So uh, basically, Johnson said the very first step in writing was figuring out why Luke is on the island. All right. We know he's not a coward. He's not just hiding because he's scared. But we also know that he must know his friends are in danger. He must know the galaxy needs him. But he's sitting on this island in the middle of nowhere. There has to be an answer as to why. There had to be something that Luke believes he's doing the right thing by remaining in exile. And Johnson went on to say the process of figuring out what that is and unpackaging and unpackaging it will be the journey for Ray. So it's almost like they're going to be helping each other eventually. Doesn't it sound like where, you know, Luke is going to, I think we've seen some of the training scenes. I mean, he is eventually going to provide help, but it also seems like Ray being there and probably her prodding and pushing and eventually talking to him and then, you know, kind of clearing the air after their, her surprise visit. It sounds like Ray's another part of Ray's journey is also going to be learning about why Luke is the way he is, which for us will be our window into what happened to Luke. Yeah, I mean, we know, like you said, we know that he eventually breaks down and starts training her. So it's going to be this interesting kind of mix of him helping her come into her physical, you know, her physical prime and then, you know, bringing her up in the force so she's capable of using it without just lashing out or without, you know, having any control over it. And then it's also going to be Ray helping him realize that, look, there was a mistake that you made that, you know, th- this horrible tragedy happened because of it, but that doesn't mean that you have to shut yourself away from everybody. The galaxy needs you. You're one of the most powerful Jedi in history and you're sitting on the sidelines and you're watching the, this, you know, galaxy be torn apart by forces of evil that are, that are almost exactly like what you fought, you know, 40, 30 or 40 years ago with the empire. So it, it's, it's going to be this, this training session for both of them, him, Luke getting over the, the tragedies that's happened in his past, not to mention the ones that we don't know. I mean, like we said, heading up to this movie, there's 30 years that we're not covering before we we even get here. So who knows what happened, you know, even before the, uh, the Jedi Academy or even before, you know, Luke started training people. There could be a lot of traumatic incidents in Luke's past that have now just piled on top of him that he really needs to work out. And doing it, you know, in solitude is very hard. But if you have somebody there who actually cares about you and who's who wants to help you through it, then it, it can be a lot easier, especially if that person is, you know, has things in common with you like Ray and Luke do. We've all mentioned them before. If you go back and listen to the previous podcast, we've mentioned the many similarities between these characters, them both being abandoned at birth. I mean, Ray is obviously a little bit of a different circumstance than Luke because he was given to family members, but, you know, not knowing their parents growing up, coming into their force abilities late in life, you know, having this, this behemoth evil force in front of them when they first start to come into their powers I mean, these two characters have a lot in common, and that could help Luke kind of break out of this this funk, this craze that he's in, all cooped up on this island. So, well, yeah, according think- to Hamill, like uh, I guess when he first read the script, Luke's mindset and and the you know behavior was so shocking to him that uh, he said he and Ryan had to almost go back and. It, we might not see all this people. I mean, I, I kind of got excited first when I saw this, but it sounds like they kind of went back and charted out Luke's journey from Jedi up until now, just so Mark as an actor could get to that place where Luke is at, you know, cause Mark, the last time he played Luke, 
again, he was this heroic, I'm all about the Jedi and the light side of the force type of character. And now he gets a script where he's reading, yo, Luke's a fucking asshole. He fucking hates himself. He hates the force. He's unsure of the force. Yada, yada, yada. So it, we're going to see a Luke that is a one, a 180 degree different than what we saw in Jedi. It's so different that the actor that portrayed him for the bulk of his life literally had to go back with the, the writers and kind of create this history just so he could get ready to become this new version of Luke. Yeah, I, I think that's very important for Mark, too, because he's so attached to this character. He's so attached to Luke Skywalker. It's essentially, I mean, he, he made his career off of it, but he's done other stuff aside from that. But he is known and will forever be known as Luke Skywalker. So to come back to a character and literally not know what he's been doing for the last 30 years is probably pretty hard to do. And then when you read these things, like like you're in the script, I mean, it's, it's confusing. It's a little bit, um, you know hard to to deal with and that's why a lot of those rumors came out early in filming for the last jedi if you can remember like there were a lot of rumors a lot of different things coming out in articles saying like you know mark hamill doesn't agree with the direction of luke skywalker's character there's you know conflict between ryan johnson and, and mark hamill because of the direction that they're taking with luke in the movie and all this different kind of stuff and now we we know why that is because Luke has, I mean, Mark has gotten to the point to where he, he thought he knew who Luke Skywalker was, but then he reads the script and it's a completely different character and he had to come to grips with that. He had to, he had to change his perception of a character that he thought he was. So it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty different way. It excited me. I mean, when I heard, when I read that, I'm like, fuck. I mean, I guess I, I think we both kind of realize that Luke is not going to be the Luke we, we left off with. I don't think we realized how damaged he is mentally. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one thing that I had mentioned in a previous podcast is, you know, sitting on an island like that, like no, no matter what happened prior to his exile, you know, kind of sequestering yourself to a to an unknown, well, not really an unknown, but like to a region of the galaxy where nobody knows where you are and you're just left with your thoughts, that can really degradate somebody's mental state and you know luke may be this all-powerful jedi master he may be able to commune with you know force ghosts like you know obi-wan kenobi and yoda and others but that doesn't mean that that the the solitude is going to help him in any way and i don't think he realized that when he first went there when he went there he thought that okay i'm gonna go here i'm gonna get my shit together hopefully and then start moving on but I, I really feel like the solitude has has hurt him more than it's helped him and he's going to realize that once he has this companion yeah, I, there i agree I, so. I still think we're going to learn that he had to go in the exile you think that there was like a like a like a physical threat out there yeah that like, like it, it's almost from? like he was starting to get tugged on too hard by snoke or the dark side or maybe him and snoke were boys uh, I want to read another quote that, that kind of – this comes from Hamill now. Now, Hamill hints that Luke has begun to doubt his connection to the Force, and he's wondering if he's been misreading it all this time. So Hamill says, Luke made a huge mistake in thinking that his nephew was the chosen one. I found that to be an interesting line. All right, so we're still kicking the tires on the chosen one. You know, Obi thought Luke was the chosen one. Qui-Gon thought Anakin was the chosen one. Now Luke thinks Ben Solo was the chosen one. But then he says Luke is betrayed with tragic consequences. Luke feels responsible for that. That's the primary obstacle he has to rejoining the world and his place in the Jedi hierarchy. It's the guilt, the feeling that it's his fault that he didn't detect the darkness in him until it was too late. But then there's this line, but there's more to it than we know. There's also more to it than the film itself will reveal. So that means, I assume that means we're going to be getting more of this storyline into episode nine, right? Like, or Yeah, and, that, and I think it's like, just, again, it, Luke's exile is, there's more to it than just what's on the surface of he felt like he really fucked up and he needed to get away. It, yeah, I, mean, I think that it's a part of that and something potentially other. more sinister. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there we all know that Snoke has been in the galaxy for a while. He's this, you know, as he was described pre Episode Seven. He's you know this 
long standing. He's dark been around since the, the Republic, galaxy. right? I mean, he was there during the yeah. Republic days. He watched the Republic he, fall. I mean, he fall. watched the the Empire fall. Yeah, so he he's been around for a while. So to know that this force is now outwardly present in the galaxy, and to have a failure like he did with Kylo, you know, maybe he did feel like he was exposed too much. Like Snoke now sees that he's weak and that he's exploited. He can be exploited. You know, maybe Snoke was trying to feed on him, like, "Hey, come, come to my side. Come, come with me, and we can redeem Kylo together." Something like that. You know, but I mean, it's going to be, I think he's going to have the the most interesting part of this entire movie. I mean, obviously, for all longstanding Star Wars fans like you and me, getting to see Luke Skywalker again in more than just a 10 second half pan around an island is going to be well worth the price of admission for this ticket. But also getting to find out, you know, part of the reason that he is the way he is and why his mental state is in the way it is, you know, is in the state it is. That's going to be the best part of the movie, regardless of the the storylines that are going to be happening with, you know, Finn and Poe and every, everybody else. I really think that Luke Skywalker is going to be the highlight. of. Oh, yeah. Story. I mean, it just goes on to say that, you know, Luke is finally starting to realize that there's nowhere he can run to where he can escape himself. As you were making a point, like he's so in his head right now and someone that has that type of power. I mean, God knows what he's been doing to himself, but it ends, you know, deep down this farm boy turned warrior turned exile would also like to meet the hero known as Luke Skywalker again. So I, I think through through time, through working with Ray, when when he finally does open up to her and they kind of fill the broken or missing pieces in each other. You know, I think through working with Luke, she's going to learn more about her past, which is going to help her future. And through working with Ray, Luke is going to learn potentially more about what his future can hold than what he thought it could. So I, it was a good piece, very revealing uh, as, as Johnson yeah. said, he said only more is coming out, uh, but it, they didn't stop there. People EW went on to do a big expose on the characters of Finn and Rose Tico, who is played by Kelly Marie Tran. And um, we got some insights on these characters, Nick, that I don't think we are expecting. I, I can tell you, I did not expect to hear or to uh, Finn to be in the mental state that this article revealed. Yeah. Cause uh, again, like if you, if you want to stay clean on this, this is another spoiler, you know, section coming up with Finn's character. But he was essentially in a state of just like in a mental state where he just gave up. He was like, I'm done with this shit. Like, I just got slashed in the back with a lightsaber. In the article, it says that he can still feel the burn. It never fully healed. He can still feel the pain of that strike that Kylo landed across his back. And he was just done. He was like, look, I came in to, you know, help this girl Ray to take down Starkiller Base. Starkiller Base is taken down. You know, Ray is out there. She's with Luke Skywalker now. She doesn't need me. And I'm done. I'm getting out of here. And I really well, did not expect that. Well, he even mentions that, you know, Finn may want to go grab Ray and just run off together. I mean, it, it's yeah. just like that is when, when, when he first gets out of his tank, his his mindset, his ultimate goal is peace out. I, yeah, I did my time with you guys. I'm done. I'm out. But it's Rose, who we learned is a very unassuming, kind of a lovable loser type of character. She's a nobody. She's a gearhead, a grease monkey, someone that, you know, works on the resistance fleet. Her sister, we learned she has one page, is a pimp. She's a, a, a pilot. She's a gunner who fights on the front lines along with the resistance. You know, she, she has fought with Poe. So it, it's, it's this character, and really the, the title of the piece was essentially – this big hero, because we did also learn that Finn has now, you know, kind of like Luke, Han, and Leia were after A New Hope, he's become already a legend within the Resistance, right? I mean, he and a few other people single-handedly blew up Starkiller Base. Yeah. So, so Finn yeah. is this hero, and, and Rose looks at him as a hero and holds him to that standard. And apparently it's, it's her admiration of Finn— and some situation where they kind of sign up to do a mission together is what is eventually going to keep Finn with the resistance and probably um, by the end of the movie have him fully committed to their cause, right? I mean, it, it sounds like she's the one 
that reminds him of of what he has done and what else he can do and that uh, you know he's better off serving the resistance than just being a loner and uh, pretending that he can just bury his head in the sand and the first order will go away yeah i mean this girl essentially comes up to him like a fangirl like oh my god you're you're finn you're the guy who helped destroy star killer base you fought kylo ren with a lightsaber you weren't even a jedi or anything like that you fought this guy and you you know you get you almost gave your life for the cause and in his mind he's thinking of himself as like this coward this you know i have to get out of here he's in this completely different state of mind and then when he finally sees that the type of inspiration that he's given to people then it it kind of switches it, it it flips the switch in his mind he's like you know maybe i'm not done here maybe there's more for me to do here and we've seen the the previews and we've seen the images that show him and rose you know in full first order garb on some sort of first order vessel there were some images that were also released with this ew tra- um these ew pieces that showed finn in the cockpit of a of some sort of starfighter i could he's on that he's explaining. on that crate you can tell yeah, yeah, you can see that like red dust it, yeah. in the back, so uh, it, he's yeah. definitely going to be there, and I'm assuming Poe's there too. Yeah, so he's but like you said, when he comes out of that tank, all he's thinking about is where's Ray? Can I get to her? And can I get the fuck out of here? Because and and this is really the first time that we've kind of seen something like this. Well, you know what? I just it, you know what it's like. It's like Han before the Battle of Yavin. Yeah, he was like, just give me my money I, I helped and, and you. Let yeah, me go. I helped you guys. We saved the princess. I risked my neck. I got you to where you need to go. Pay me, I'm out. You know, yeah. he, he didn't have that. Well, at first, we didn't think he had that bond to these new friends, but we, did, we learned later on. And I still think it was probably Chewie giving him a hard time. They come back and they ultimately, Han, you could say Luke's the reason they blew up the Death Star, but it's really Han when you think about it. I mean, yeah, Han we, we don't give out. Han enough credit for... Uh, taking out that TIE fighter, which bumps off Vader and sends him out of the trench and allows Luke to use the force to drop the proton bombs into the exhaust port. Uh, but but Han was kind of, you know, uh, and I think Finn is the Han character. He is kind of the, 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 the funny guy, the, the roguish type, but a, a reluctant hero at that. I mean, he just wanted to get away from doing evil shit and live his life in peace. He got roped into this resistance now through Ray. He came back for Ray. So and now he just wants to leave, but because of his hero status and I think he likes having his ego str- uh, stroked a bit. This uh, Rose is going to kind of keep him around long enough to get mixed up in a big mission to Canto Bite, which is this casino city we've been hearing about and there, we learned today that those two are essentially charged with tracking down Benicio del Toro's DJ character. Um, so we can yeah. kind of move into the revelations about him today. Uh, Nick, I know you didn't read it, but I mean, essentially, just said they still didn't give his name. He's DJ. He's dressed kind of ratty, but he supposedly has one of the sharpest minds in the galaxy and he's very uh, skilled at his trade it sounds like he's skilled uh, with a gun or in combat but what we found out today about uh, dj is that he is what's called a splicer in the star wars universe which is synonymous with a hacker and apparently the reason finn and rose are sent to canto bite to find him is they need him to be a code breaker to break some sort of code um, and we learned that DJ, he doesn't play for a certain side. He's not good nor bad, even though at first we kind of thought that he'd be playing a villain. But he, he's kind of a gray area type of guy. He's a, he's a war dog. He's someone that he'll sell weapons to the Iraqis and the Americans type of guy. As long as he's getting paid, as long as there's conflict going on, he's happy. So we're, we're going to see Finn and Rose head off to go find this guy. And I don't know, dude, deep down... I have a feeling DJ's sticking with these two. I think it's gonna he's gonna find himself in a situation where he probably has to stick with those two. I mean, like you mentioned, he's good in a fight, but you know, when you have the first order on your ass, are you that good in a fight? Can you take on, you know, two first order destroyers by yourself in your ship, or do you think you need some help to get out of there? Um, I think that's probably gonna be the situation that we're gonna find there. Is he gonna stick with the resistance long term after that? Who knows? But but I think you're right. I mean, he's definitely a gray area character. And, ne- and now knowing the types of, you know, 
dealings that he has being a hacker, uh, it makes sense as to why, you know, he has this kind of lavish ship for a person that we thought was relatively, you know, when you look at him, relatively like a fucking unassuming. Bomb. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, like you said, he dresses, he doesn't dress in any kind of fancy way, he doesn't, you know, act from what we could see or, you know, what was described of him in any kind of outward kind of, you know, outstanding fashion. He's just this guy, he's, you know, wears a lot of brown, a lot of dingy clothing, doesn't really, you know, not really too assuming, but that's how he makes his money. He makes his money dealing in information, dealing in hacking for both sides and, you know, the fact that the resistance is going to him at all is very telling of the situation that they're in. Because well, yeah, usually well, that's, would... I forgot to mention that, give you a little background, but uh, apparently the resistance is so bad off right when The Last Jedi starts. I mean, a lot of people may have the misconception that blowing up Starkiller base was like a big win. You got to remember what happened before that and how the resistance was treated by the New Republic. I mean, they, they were, they're the resistance for a reason. They're not part of the New Republic, never have been. They're like a splinter cell. And now that the New Republic has been scattered and put into disarray, the resistance is even more alone than ever before. So they're essentially on their heels getting their ass kicked, Empire Strikes Back style. Yeah, and that's actually something Ryan mentioned in in this article as well. Is that you know, a lot of people mentioned the uh, you know the the parallels between A New Hope and um, The Force Awakens, and a lot of people are also pointing to parallels between this movie or looking forward to parallels between this movie and Empire Strikes Back. But he said it was never his intention to actually make the the films mirror each other. He just said that he wanted to tell the story as it was, and you know the situation that like you mentioned, that the resistance was in, that these characters were in, with Rey being off on a secluded island, like, you know, Luke was off on Dagobah in in Episode 5. It just happens to line up in the same way. Now, obviously, the writers of this stuff, you know, wrote the parallels in there for a reason. The director is the one that brings it to life, but, you know, clearly this film is, is meant to show you a side of the resistance that we haven't seen yet. Um, and it's the side that's, like you said, it has them in peril. It has them at on, on the brink of destruction almost because just because they blew up, you know, Starkiller Base doesn't mean that everything is right in the world. Like you said, I mean, when we saw Starkiller Base, that was actually the first time it was ever being used. That was the first time it was being fired and the, the first destruction that anybody's ever seen from that space station. So it's not like Starkiller Base has been sitting there as this, you know, this huge, massive destroyer of planets yeah. for everybody to it, see it wasn't their stronghold either right i mean snoke yeah, no. wasn't even physically there no so it's not like this was the only intimidation factor that the first order had and then it was destroyed the first order was was in the position that they were because of their military force and because of everything else that they were doing outside of star killer base you were i mean the resistance was just able to destroy it before it could do more damage so now like you said, they're without a government that's backing them. They're without any kind of support at all. And they're probably dealing with a, with a galaxy that is frightened for their lives after seeing, you know, just the type of destruction that could happen at the hands of this new oppressive regime that's trying to take over the galaxy. So they're not only fighting against the First Order, they're fighting against fear across the galaxy. And, you know, that's a that's a very tough situation to be in when you have people that are just hesitant or too scared to join your cause out of fear of death i mean it's it's really tough yeah man i i don't i'm I'm really i feel bad learning some of this information but it also excites me um the the narrative is starting to come to life much more than we we've had in the past i mean outside the trailer we haven't had much to draw on these pieces kind of did broad strokes painting out some plot points and i i think i'm starting to kind of formulate what's what's going on here and, and i dig that so one of the the last big articles that came out from ew this week and it came out today it was about uh, general leia and poe and their relationship as well as how leia is going to be handled in the film now that we know you know obviously fisher died after filming and won't be available for episode nine uh, but what we do learn, we'll start with kind of the relationship between Leia and Poe. And Oscar Isaac, the guy that plays Poe, described it as Leia has kind of taken Poe under her wing as a surrogate son. 
right? I mean, he would have been kind of the same age as Ben. Obviously, Leia at the start of this movie probably isn't going to be feeling so great. Uh, Han was just murdered by her son. Her son has fully fallen to the dark side, or so we think. And they're pretty much getting their asses kicked. I mean, Johnson goes on to say, um, hold on, sorry, here. He had a good quote in here. I don't want to tip the hat too much, but I will say that the heat is immediately turned up on the resistance. Everybody's put in a pressure cooker right away and relationships crack and strain under that pressure. Um, So Leia is not going to have an easy go in this episode, but it sounds like her and Poe are going to be working closely together and that Leia is going to be maybe not directly, but through their interactions, she's going to start imparting uh, her leadership qualities to him because in Poe she sees the next leader of the resistance more so than just a great X-Wing pilot. Yeah, I mean, we can see in episode seven that he's gung ho, like he's all in on the resistance and we we really don't have another character in the, in that movie, at least to point to as, you know, the heir to the, to the resistance throne or as the person who's going to take over after, General Leia passes, you know, we all know that's going to happen now. So the fact that she's grooming him and has kind of taken her, taken Poe under her wing is, is pretty, is pretty interesting, especially since he's, he's really more of a combat guy. Like we, we don't really see him in, you know, these situations that Leia is usually in where, you know, she's dealing with diplomacy or she's dealing with the troops and stuff like that. She's strategizing. He's more of like the in your face pilot. He's the fighter. And now he's going to be transitioning into this role as a leader. So there could be some struggle there for him. It's like, you know, what if he's, you know, what's, what's going to happen the first time he's behind the desk. And then, you know, he sees that a battle is going wrong. Is he going to run out to his X-wing and be like, Hey, I can, I can save this. I can stop this from happening. Or is he going to be able to accept that, you know, you win some, you lose some, and I can't put myself out in dangerous situations just because things are going bad. I need to, you know, take a big picture look at things, and I don't know if he's capable of that right now. But that, you, you honestly, I don't know if you're reading the damn article, but you pretty much summed it up perfectly. Where I was not <laughs> po, Poe's arc, and, and this is a quote, people. Poe's arc is one of evolving from a heroic soldier to a seasoned leader to see beyond the single-mindedness of winning the battle to the larger picture of the future of the galaxy. I think Leia knows she won't be around forever. So with tough love, and we did hear there's a, she is going to slap Poe because he's been telling that story of how Carrie kind of beat his ass and just took pleasure in doing take after take after take of slapping him. But essentially say with tough love, Leia is going to push Poe to realize that he's more than just a badass pilot and that his heroic impulses kind of need to be tempered with wisdom and clarity to become the leader. So, I mean, I don't think this, uh, this uh, mentor mentee relationship is going to be all cordial. I don't think it's going to be like Poe is asking for this. I think it's going to be Leia and and the tough person that Leia is and the tough leader. She is kind of shoving it in his face and pushing him into that direction in a loving manner, but also as a, you know, kind of a tough parent, like, listen, dude, you're a badass, but you can do so much more than just blowing away TIE fighters. Yeah, exactly. You need to kind of take a step back, follow my lead, because I'm not going to be here forever. And obviously, she's not. Yeah, and actually, in previous podcasts, I had talked about that I thought that, that the new character, that Laura Dern's character, would be taking that mantle as the you know the figurehead or the leader and of I the resistance. And I swear to God you're using the Force because that's right where the piece goes next. <laughs> The conflict <laughs> within is the subheading. Oh man! So, See, so here I'm, I'll, I'll just I'll give you. It. No, you, you're you're right on, dude. I mean, it just proves we have a uh, connection to the force. But essentially, the, this whole part of this article is about how there are there are conflicts within the resistance, and he they specifically mention Laura Dern's Vice Admiral Holdo. So she is part of the resistance. Uh, she is a fellow commander, and she is going to have some sort of history with Leia. But the movie will be how that is revealed so johnson said the secrecy of holdo does have a purpose and that's part of the fun with laura's character is figuring out what her relationship is to everybody as you go along throughout the movie 
So it does sound like maybe Holdo and Leia, while they can be cordial, you know, politically, that they may not be total comrades or on the same page as far as the resistance goes and how to run it. Yeah, I mean, they're, it's almost like they're positioning Holdo's character as like this usurper, this person who's trying to, you know, not really seize power, but put herself in a position to where when an opening comes, she's going to be the one to fill it. And Leia realizes that. Leia also realizes that she's not the best person for the job, and that's why she's trying to groom Poe to take over this position after, you know, after she dies. And that's probably going to be, that's going to bring out a very interesting dynamic between Holdo and and Leia to see this. It's almost, it's going to be like a power struggle that you're going to see in, in the, in the scenes with these two characters. Like you said, they'll be cordial when they're around, you know, the peons and when they're around, you know, the, the, the underlings of the resistance, I guess you could say, but in private, there's, it's probably a very contentious relationship at the very least. Yeah. So, I mean, we, like I said, these pieces shed a ton of light on things to come and, and the Leia piece kind of wraps with, and this is something I, I've been wanting to talk about with Nick. Cause I just, I, I, I can't see how this happens. Uh, but the subheading here is the unwanted farewell, obviously referring to Fisher passing before, she could complete episode nine, which everyone's been telling us she was supposed to have a major role in it. But the first thing you read in this section is the storyline wasn't changed after Fisher's death. But Johnson says he hopes it will be satisfying to the Legion of Leia fans who see the character as a source of true life inspiration in our world. There's no way, and this is Johnson speaking, there's no way that we could have known this would have been the last Star Wars movie she would be in. So it's not like we made the film thinking that we were bringing closure to the character. But watching the film, there's going to be a very emotional reaction to what she does in this movie. Hmm. I I mean, how the hell do you take that, dude? I mean, is this just an elaborate smokescreen that they've been throwing up all along and that Leia might be going out in the last Jedi anyways, or is it, is it bullshit? I I just, I don't know how a character of Leia's stature and and Boyega references last week, in another article saying it's going to be one of the most emotional send offs for a character of all time. And I'm just going, well, if they didn't, if Leia was supposed to be in nine and play a major role, then obviously you can't predict Fisher's dying. How would they know to give her this, emotional send-off i mean is she is she truly gonna die then or is it gonna be like she fucking pilots herself into a star i don't i do i don't know go go I, i'm i'm like blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what do you what do you have this to is think? definitely i feel like it's a smoke screen because we already know like it's it's been out there that ryan johnson had to work with colin trevorrow that's, to yeah, rewrite that's what i'm parts saying episode nine he it's already out there so Nine was affected by Carrie Fisher's passing. So it's not like he could have... It's not like episode eight had an ending written in that already wrapped up Leia's he, I mean, he says it. He says that exactly. When we made the film, we weren't thinking we were bringing closure to the character. Yeah, so I... I, I don't understand how he says that, you know, it's, she's going to have this grand send-off in a way that he wasn't expecting. It's like, oh, well, now that I know what's happened and now that I, you know, now that everything that, you know, has passed has passed, when I watch the movie, it seems emotionally resonant and it seems like it wraps it up in a different way. Like, I'm not sure what exactly he's trying to get to, but I I can guarantee you that they did not have a a death scene for Leia in that movie. Not and, and less, like, no. unless they've been bullshitting us from day one, which I, I just I don't think they were. I, I don't think they are. No, I think Leia I mean, was supposed to be in nine, and whatever this act they're talking about, I don't think it was a, an act of finality. Like I don't think it's a a a sacrifice for the greater good. But that's kind of what they're making it sound like. Yeah, it's. I feel like part of it's a smoke screen and then part of it is also like Ryan going back and finding, you know, this maybe emotional grabbing some shit on the floor and scrubbing it back in. I mean, I I don't know. I just it's possible. It intrigues the hell out of me because, I mean, Johnson, 
he's not a promoter, so I don't think he's throwing these sensational words out there just to build up hype. I mean, he, he's a fucking artist. I mean, he still shoots on a, a shitty camera with film. Uh, he's just a, he's a little film nerd. Uh, so the fact yeah. that he he and Boyega have both said something very similar about how Fisher will go out or how Leia will be sent off. Now, I mean, that doesn't have to mean she's going to die, but it's kind of hard to think that she's not going to die and then just not be present in nine whatsoever. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, Fisher's passing horrible. I mean, it robbed the the character of Leia of her arc that was planned for it robbed fans. It robbed her family. I mean, I know I sound like a selfish asshole, but it, it just sucks because we're always going to have this question mark now of, well, what was supposed to happen is what we're going to get in eight. Was that there all along and they were just fucking being tricksters or is what happened to Fisher going to significantly change the final act of this trilogy? Yeah. And now that I'm thinking about it, like, now that it's been revealed that there is this contentious relationship with um with Amelyn Holdo's character, the well the character of Amelyn Holdo in the movie with Laura Dern's character, maybe there's like some sort of weird split and like, you know, maybe something happens cuz everybody everybody who's acted in this movie, everybody who's been a part of making this movie keeps saying there's stuff that's going to happen in here that nobody is expecting. There's stuff, I mean, this is a, and they've also said that this is, this movie can be looked at as a solo film and could still make sense outside of the trilogy. So we know one, that there's going to be some curveballs in here that, that we don't know, that we don't expect. And two, that there's going to be a lot of storylines that are both started and finished within this film. So with the revelation about Amal and Holdo and Leia's relationship being contentious and with the way that I'm looking at it is that Amal and Holdo is trying to seize power in the resistance to do something. So now that I'm thinking about like what could happen where Leia's character is somehow wrapped up without a, a planned death scene. The only thing that I could think of is that like there's some sort of division within the resistance. Something happens, whether it's Luke coming back and people are weary of it and they don't want to trust them or something happens to where there's like this division and leadership in the resistance and Holdo takes over and then Leia almost goes into an exile or like, you know, pulls herself out of the fray similar to how Luke did. And then the the film kind of ends with her going off into exile. In yeah. Some you way. know, I was kind of thinking that too, or like maybe she somehow disappears into the force. I don't fucking know, dude, but I just, that what happens to Leia now is almost more important to me in just seeing how it plays out than the rest of the fucking movie. Yeah. Cause I, I mean, it's an unknown storyline and it's an unfinished, no matter how you look at it, it's an unfinished storyline, regardless of the fact that this is the last time that we're going to see her her story is going to be unfinished as it was written initially. So we'll never get to see what the true arc for her was. I mean, just playing off the back of that speculation that I just threw out, like maybe her arc in nine was like coming back into the fray and then regaining, you know, control over the resistance and then finally leading it into, you know, whatever, taking down the, the first order. There's a lot of different things that could happen in a situation like that. But I mean, I can't think, I can't think of anything that would line itself up to be a a wrap up for her character that wasn't intended. Like that's just it's just weird the way that he stated that. What I think happened is like Carrie died, everybody was really emotional. Everybody went back and watched the movie and then realized, you know, or saw a lot of emotional moments for her character within it and they're like, "You know what? This was a very powerful performance from her. This was a very, you know, there was a lot of great moments for Leia in this movie. And it's, you know, it's actually not as bad as we thought. Well, didn't we also hear an, an anecdote maybe uh, during it was either Star Wars Celebration or D23 where uh, one of the one of the cast members essentially said that at the end of filming, I think it was Johnson telling a story. But the end of filming, you know, uh, Fisher was essentially like, yo, you, you fucking gave Ham all the screen time in eight. I better get my shit in nine. And he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. You're you're going to you're definitely going to be a prominent part. So, 
I don't yeah, know, dude. I mean, I mean just even... is it bullshit? Is it some bullshit, some reality? I just I have a hard time believing that Leia can have this, as everyone's describing, very emotional send off or very emotional act that fans are going to accept as like, OK, that was that that was worthy of this character never showing up in another Star Wars movie again. We'll see. I mean, obviously, sacrifices are huge in this trilogy so far. I mean, you've had Han Solo go down, essentially sacrificing himself for his son in in some sort of way. Um, who knows? Maybe she finds herself in the fray and, you know, she gets hit with something that wasn't intended to kill her in, in the original script. And then, you know, episode nine has her come back, has this awesome kind of you know, come back to health and then lead the resistance on the victory narrative, but then it eventually just turns into her her death there or something. I'm not exactly sure. I think it's a lot of, it could be smoke. It could be, you know, people just looking back and trying to make ends meet, trying to make things tie up in their mind so they don't have to, you know, to struggle with the fact that she's not going to be a nine. Because I think that's going to be a struggle for all of us, especially, and it's going to be the biggest struggle for those that were close to her, that worked with her on these films. And I think in in Ryan's case, having written a hefty portion of this movie and then helped in writing Episode Nine as well, as all directors on Star Wars do, they help with the storyline. Like, I think he needed to to wrap her up in his mind, and then he went back and he watched the movie and he's like, okay, I can I can reconcile it based off of this. But I don't think that there's an actual, like, an actual wrap up moment for her in that movie. I, I really don't think that there yeah, is. Yeah, and I'm not blaming any of these people. I mean, how, you can't fucking predict that shit. I mean, obviously, everyone knew Carrie wasn't right in the head and, and hadn't been for a long time. And once the autopsy came out, I mean, she had a cocktail of fucking poison in her system. I and mean, she was like hocked up on coke, heroin. I mean, she was still clearly a, a flawed human. Uh, it's just it's a shame all around i mean god rest her soul rest in peace carrie but damn did you really throw a wrench into this trilogy fuck yeah 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 i mean i think that after we see after this movie comes out and after everybody sees it i think we'll all feel okay i think in the end yeah i, I do trust johnson and the people that are in charge of star wars at this point in time um, but it's just like, damn, I, I, I can't wait much longer. And luckily we don't have to, it, it's going to be here before we know it. I got a fall of hell to go through lots of bullshit, lots of bullshit to do in real life. But December will be here before we know it. And we'll get these answers. Hopefully. Yep. Yep. Hopefully. All right, so dude. I think that about wraps it up for this, right? That's everything EW dropped. I mean, like you said, bombshell on top of bombshell, Possible spoilers on top of possible spoilers, but I mean, if and there's more to come. One... I mean, I know for a fact we're going to get a a write up on Johnson reflecting on the importance of Ray's parentage. So, you know, check check for that on entertainmentboot.com tomorrow. I'll definitely recap EW's post and get it out there. But I mean, Johnson sp- explicitly on Twitter today said, "More is coming." More than he would probably like to share, but, you know, it, it, that's just the nature of the beast, as he said. So be careful, people. The Star Wars somewhat spoilers are really starting to hit the Internet with flair. So watch out or be like us and succumb to the dark side and click on every damn link you see that has Star Wars The Last Jedi in its title because – there's no way I'm going to – we can't, right, Nick? I mean we, we have to kind of fall on these grenades for you people, right? We do. Um, we do. You know, being, we take in this information. We, we read it so you can listen to it from us and then we notify you like we did with this cast. There are spoilers here. If you want to say spoiler free, get away. So we'll take, the, we'll take the bombs. We'll take the blaster rounds to the chest for you guys and go in a little less than 100% pure for episode eight. But you know what? We like doing that kind of stuff. That's why we do this cast. That's why we're hawking the news all the time for Star Wars goodies out there. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, I'm looking forward to reading it at least. I, I really want to see what he's got to say about, you know, all the great stuff coming from Episode 8. 
Yeah, totally. So, as always, my friends and all you nerf herders out there in the galaxy, thanks for tuning in to the Star Wars Time Show hosted by myself and my man Nick Caminita. Uh, we will be taking a break for a bit, so we won't be recording next Friday, which would be the 18th. But we should be back on the air by the end of August to get another cast out. And there will be stuff because, Nick, I think from here on out, it might not be like this week where you're just getting punched in the face with Star Wars reveals. But I think we're going to we'll probably get the next trailer coming up here pretty soon by the end of uh, summer, maybe sometime in September. Then the TV spots will start rolling in around October and we'll be off to the races. So. You know what to do, people. Stay tuned to the best podcast for Star Wars fans and pop culture geeks, what you can do through iTunes, Stitcher, Google, Android. It's all over the place. Just give us the love. Give us your ears. We do appreciate you. And hopefully you are entertained or you at least get some insights from us two gas bags about Star Wars because uh, we can clearly talk about it ad nauseum. So as we like to do and as we always leave you, may the force be with you always.